Hey, traders, this is Blake Morrow with Traders Summit. And with me today, once again, I have Mr. Mark Chandler with Bannockburn Forex. How are you, Mark? It's good to see you and good to hash this out uh, post FOMC. Yeah, what a challenging time we have, huh? You know, I, it, it is challenging, but I guess as traders, you know, for for the trading community at large, we're getting some volatility, which is good, right? We're getting interest rate expectations are moving around. We actually might see a lift off here over the next couple of months. It's exciting times, but yeah, there's it's definitely uh, definitely some two way price action, right? Yeah, I think that the that's part of the challenge. I think is that uh, the new volatility sort of is, I think. Uh, uh, undermining our confidence. I mean, think about what happened. We began the year with an upside breakout of dollar yen, yeah, not sustained. And then, uh, so he's okay. So if the dollar is going to be a week, then let's go buy the euro. Euro breaks out to the top side of a, what a two month trading range, yeah. and that doesn't prove sustained. And now we have the dollar breaking higher, and I think that's the question: is that are these trends sustained, or is this just like volatility? That's that's a great question. So that, that that probably leads us to like what happened yesterday. So what what did what happened with well, you know, we're, this is after the fact. You know, we're 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 a day late or day later, day after the fact and post FOMC, we've got stocks that have, you know, rallied today. They they've kind of regained their composure. We're we're trading around flat now. It's kind of back and forth, but the dollar remains strong. Anything stand out today in the price action in in markets? That you're seeing that that we should be paying attention to. Yeah, sure. So I think that uh, I, I break down what the Federal Reserve what happens on a FOMC meeting in two parts. One is the statement. The statement was blasé. It was more or less what we thought or what we expected or we hoped to be in there. Sure. C confirmation of a March takeoff. Some sign that they're confident about the economy, and I think that's what we expected. And then Powell gets to the mic, and this is the recent pattern. I sent out a tweet. Uh, as the market initially rallied, the stock market initially rallied on the Fed statement. I said, we got to be careful here because this is the pattern. Rally on the statement, sell off on Powell. Sure enough, Powell this time, I think, uh, went out of his way to be to really uh, to make sure the market understood where he was coming from, where the Fed is coming from. And that is the economy is strong. The labor market is strong. Prices are well above target. The Fed is going to be tightening. And it's not only be tightening by raising interest rates, but it doesn't want to rule anything out. Because of this great uncertainty, the Fed wants to keep all of its cards on the table. It wants to be able to play anything. Faster rate hikes, uh, more rate hikes, uh, balance sheet, a quicker reduction. All these things are in play. And I think when Powell says that when he, if he could do it again, he would have raised his December dot plot on inflation. That to me was a very hawkish sign. And I, I, I get it. I mean, I, I think that he's warning the market that there's tightening coming and the market obviously, given the way it reacted, wasn't fully prepared. And we didn't, we did, he didn't really see it coming, right? Um, when you say he didn't really see it coming, I, I, I'm not sure that the stock market weakness is a, is a problem for the Fed yet. Okay. I mean, partly, right? We were at, uh, we, the S&P made record highs early this year. Yeah, uh, yeah. NASDAQ made it in November. NASDAQ sold off 20% from the highs. But the rest of the broader market, call it the Dow, maybe 10% from its high. And so these are, these. I think these, these aren't bad. This is like uh, still, I think Powell really addressed this issue, which I know we're all talking about it. What happened to the Greenspan put? When should we expect the Fed to be at our backs? And I think what, in effect, what Powell said is, don't count on it. It's not quite that simple as these, uh, as sort of, I want to say, the zero hedge crowd wants us to believe. Yeah. But Powell says the stock market is just one indicator of many that the Fed uses to understand financial conditions. And what they're interested in is how those financial conditions feed back onto the real economy. That's what they're interested in, the real economy. And those financial markets that we live in are just really the, 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 a side effect. And the Fed wants to be, make sure there's not a bad negative feedback into that. Yeah, well, you know, it, 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 but sentiment has obviously shifted in the markets now. We we are definitely seeing any type of rallies being sold into a lot of profit taking. And at what point do you think equity markets are going to, you know, start th that sentiment might shift a little bit where you start seeing dip buyers step step back in because if there is no there is no Fed put, if you will, into the markets. At what point do you have to wait for the economic data to turn? Because the stock market is not the economy, so we think, right? Yeah. So I, I think of it like this. I think that in some ways, you know, we all like to look at patterns. 
I yeah. think there's two big patterns this year to be keeping an eye on. One, of course, is what happens when the Fed raises rates. And it turns out that even though the stock market typically slips in the first three months after the first Fed rate hike, within six months, it's higher. And so the second, so that's one force is what happens to the stock market, which is risk on and risk off sense uh, when the Fed hikes. The second issue is, you know, this is the second year of a presidential site of presidential term. We have a midterm election coming up. Sure. And the average pullback. So this is a drawdown. It's not the year to year change. It's just an intra year drawdown in the second year of a presidential term could be as much as the average is around 16 percent. OK. And, and so I think that you've got some headwinds coming to the stock market in the short run. Fed tightening this kind of drawdown related to. What, what does this mean? I mean, uh, a, a presidential or political cycle. And so so I, I think that we'll see buyers reemerge, not because they think the Fed is uh, is done tightening, but because they feel more confident of the terminal rate. When will the Fed get done tightening? And we'll begin pricing that in. I think that the market, the aggressiveness of the Fed gave people, including myself, a bit like, well, where is, where is the top going to be on the Fed funds rate? And I think that the market, the market is coming around to the view that it's not going to be that much higher than they thought that the economy is going to slow down and that's going to restrict the Fed's hand like it did the last time when the Fed was letting the balance sheet shrink before the, before COVID hit. Remember 2018, 2019, they were letting the balance sheet shrink until it began clearly disrupting things and they stopped. And so that could be the case the, the, this, this time around. So I want to ask you this, Mark, looking at economic data, I mean, we're, we're, we're between you know, now, uh, the end of January, and then we're looking at mid-March when, when the Fed meets again. And how important is the economic data coming out that how, how closely should we as traders be paying attention to that data? Is it going to be important? And then second question is, what data should we all be focusing on um, you know, moving forward over the next couple of months to make sure that the Fed is going to, to, to tighten rates and at what pace? Yeah, I think, you know, you had said something uh, earlier today with uh, Dale, and you talked about how people have different uh, time horizons. It's not that one person, you, you talk to someone about where the market's going, and people yeah. seem like they disagree, but sometimes when you really dig underneath it, they have different time frames. And I think the same thing's true about the economic data. So if you're looking at... Uh, you're watching the economic data stream come in and you're anticipating it and you're positioning in front of it or after it, I'd say that, yes, the data is still going to be important for the headline effect. But for the economic impact, for the real macro impact, I don't think it matters because two reasons. One, the Fed has said, we're going to raise rates in March. They've, they've come as close to saying that as possible. Right. And the market says, you're not only going to raise rates in March by 25 basis points, but there's a chance that you're going to go 50. You know, there's a slim chance now, I'd say a one in three chance, one in four chance, but that's what the market is saying. And so uh, I, I think that means that the economic data doesn't matter so much because it's already, the Fed's almost committed to this. Second reason I'm not so sure about the economic data mattering is that Powell already admitted what we already know, I think. And that is the economy has lost some steam here from that, you know, we saw that 6.9% Q4 annualized growth pace. And Q1 is going to be much slower. It's going to feel awful. It's going to go from, say, 7% growth to whatever it is, 2% growth, 3% growth if we're lucky. And so I think that first quarter data we already know is going to be slow. So we don't have to, not that we don't have to pay attention to it, because if you're trading and you're watching your own personal trading account, of course, it's going to matter how you trade. But yeah. from a big macro point of view, from an investor's point of view, probably doesn't matter until we begin getting some signs of Q date, Q2 data and have an idea about the kind of momentum that the economy has going into it. So if we weaken in January, February, and then strengthen in March, that'll give us a better setup then for Q2. All right. Well, that's that's a, that's good to know. And I mean, as traders, you know, we tend to be very sensitive to that data as it's being released. That that session can give us a little bit of volatility. But what you're saying is basically, you know, you got to think of more bigger picture and what the Fed is that they're on track to do no matter what. There's not a lot that's going to happen between now and mid-March that's really going to influence them much on, on this path that they're currently on. Is that correct? Yeah, I think so. But it's also like yeah, I, I always try to be very careful about like uh, trying to tell a batter how to change their stance. <laughs> like, uh, like guys like yourself, I know you've got you got your own ways of doing things and your own like shortcuts and your own way to sum up data that macro guys like me spend a lot of time trying to like digest. And I, I have a lot of respect for that. And so I think what that means is that 
just to be aware that some stuff is already baked in the cake. All the right. Fed March hike is baked in the cake. And there's very little that'll happen between now and March. There are things that could happen. I mean, you can imagine a, a bigger crash in the stock market. Yeah. Uh, you can imagine that there's a full-fledged war in Europe, not just uh, Russia taking another part of Ukraine, but uh, uh, I mean, imagine if China takes Taiwan at the same time. And so there's a lot of things that could change. But I'd say as far as these, as far as like what we could, what we could incorporate into these kind of like scenarios, I think it's pretty much baked in the cake. You know what's interesting, Mark, is you know you 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 if if I took if I went backwards like uh, two mo- two weeks ago, let's just say, and and a lot of people that I talk to, a lot of traders I talk to, say, well, you know, Blake, everybody's expecting you know the Fed to rate rate uh, to to, uh, to to hike rates. It's already baked in. You know how much bullish more bullish can the dollar be? Well, fast forward to yesterday and look where we're at right now. Um, the market did play into the dollar strength, and here we are at new trend highs in the dollar index as we close in on 98. So, um, you know, it's it, it's a dangerous game when you start thinking, oh, it's already baked in. What else What else yeah. can we have, right? Yeah, so 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 I think you're right. So that's what makes me uh, cautious. I mean, for example, looking at the swaps curve, the market's got like six Bank of Canada rate hikes coming. So that tells me that the market's going to be very sensitive to any kind of disappointment. Not that it can't rally on good news, confirming what we already know. But that it's very vulnerable to, to disappointing news. And I think the same thing is going to be true with the US. Uh, we get uh, weak data in Q2 and make the market begin thinking that maybe that fourth rate hike at the end of the year is not very likely. Maybe that the Fed will use the tape, the reducing the balance sheet like they did previously to be to supplant part of the hiking. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think that you're right that it's, it's dangerous to assume that everybody is uh, reacting to the same data set that we are the same way. But that's why I look at what's expected. And then I know where the where the disappointment can come. And so for me, like a, a telling thing was that in the last few weeks, as the euro climbed, you saw the commitment of traders in the uh, in the futures market in the euro climb. I mean, the net longs, were, excuse me, the gross longs were increasing, the shorts were getting out. And so that told me that I didn't really trust this upside breakout. That told me, though, that there's a lot of late longs that entered the market. And the late logs typically are in weak hands because they got to keep a tight stop. Yeah. And so that told me that told me that when the euro does turn, it's going to turn very aggressively. I was surprised that we got down so quickly uh, through last year's lows that we made in November. Uh, so, uh, but I do think that it's a it's a combination. I think it's like what, what you do, what we do, is is difficult. You try to try to have incorporate the economic data, what is already assumed, market positioning. And then, then like what the technicals tell us, that's sort of sometimes uh, momentum, sometimes beyond just a, uh, a quantitative sense, sort of like a qualitative sense of like how stretched the market is. Well, that's true, Mark. And, and I'll tell you, um, you know, sitting down and working it all out through through my head and through our traders' minds, uh, you know, some everything that's transpired over the last 24 hours, I just love being able to do that with you. So let me ask you this, Mark, if, if, if I'm a trader at home and I don't for some reason, have, have never seen you on CNBC or Bloomberg. I don't know who wouldn't have, but how do I find out more about you and how do I follow what you do? Yeah, so I f- first should thank you. You know, like uh, you guys uh, repost my daily commentary. It's kind of a strange kind of story. You know, I write this commentary for the bank. The bank pays me to do it and it goes to our clients and I can share it uh, with with anybody who wants it. And so I appreciate you reposting it. And I, I realize that uh, it's about the... Uh, uh, I know for some people, and like you guys, trying to build uh, a, a, like a knowledge set and a place for people to come who are who are interested in these things. Um, and so I, I appreciate that. I think this is how I can, I mean, sort of like our emails, you know, my I think my work, we use uh, Outlook. And the reason my Outlook is valuable is not because I can just email people in my office, but because I can email anybody in the world. And so I appreciate that what makes our ideas and Put them out there, in the, like the marketplace of ideas, and let people criticize them and uh, uh, push back and and support their own views. And so I, I appreciate that. And so I I post my commentary on a blog called Mark to Market. Uh, I, it really is uh, not about me so much. It, I, I came out with a book back, uh, the book I sent you actually about making oh, yeah. sense of the dollar. And I had working with this uh, incredibly uh, like innovative marketing woman at the time, uh, Margaret Kepner, and she basically told me to st- I needed to start a blog. And I thought that like the blog is like, it's like peeing in your pants. I mean, it gives you a warm feeling, but nobody knows it. 
and uh, how to drive traffic to it. It brought me into the social media in a way that uh, maybe a lot of guys my age, like experience, wouldn't have gotten involved in. And so I, I post this stuff and I'm really committed to it. And I post something every day, uh, including on Saturday and Sunday. Saturday is sort of a macro overview and Sunday is more of a uh, the chartist in me coming out and trying to really focus on the price action itself. So I'm also on Twitter. I, I try to keep something going on Twitter during the day, just uh, sometimes market views or sometimes making fun of other people. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but so, yeah, so I'm there in the social media space and I, my DM is open. People want to direct message me. Um, my stuff gets posted elsewhere, of course, but uh, I think that uh, uh, in, a, in a community in which uh, like, like you guys have built, it's maybe more understandable because then you get the macro and technical and you can see that it's sort of like that story I tell about the uh, those five blind men who, who stumble on an elephant, but they don't know it's an elephant because they're blind. So one guy feels it, the trunk and says it's a, it's a snake. Another guy feels the leg and says it's a tree. And so I, I appreciate the opportunity to say what part of the elephant I'm feeling, but it's good that people know that there's other parts of the elephant too. Oh, good. Well, maybe maybe it wasn't the trunk, or was it? <laughs> well, Mark, I, I'll tell you, I, I love re reading your daily commentary. It's one of the things that I enjoy doing with my cup of my cup of Joe in the morning. Uh, it kind of uh, gives me a great overview of how you know the market might be viewing things. It seems like you 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 tend to get up before me at least by a couple hours, and I'm not sure how that's even possible. Maybe it's because of the side of the country that I live on. But I want to say we do appreciate you, Mark, here at the Traders Summit, and I want to thank you for for joining us. And, and if you guys and gals are watching us on YouTube, make sure you give Mark a thumbs up. You're telling him, you know, hey, you really enjoy his content every day, and don't don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss any of Mark's content when we do this one to one. So, Mark, thank you so much for being with me today, and the rest of us here at Traders Summit. Hey, thanks a lot. Good luck to everybody. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Hey traders, Blake Morrow here. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also click the bell notifications so you do not miss any of our market-related trading analysis from some of the leading industry experts. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you in the next video.